Let's go to a real man here, David. David is a real man. And uh, just for a little historical background, let's look at... Uh, Well, the account, the account of David's uh, adultery. Let's go to Second Samuel. Let's see here. Second Samuel eleven. Now, in 2 Samuel 11, it says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon. And that would be the Ammonites. That, that name is the capital of Jordan today. Ammon, Jordan. They besieged Reba, but David remained at Jerusalem. Now, Lisa, what was the moral of that story? Do you remember? That's right. That's uh, one of the pitfalls is, is that people, uh, we're in war. We're in warfare, and if we're not fighting, a lot of people don't realize we're in a battle, and we're fighting. People think the church is a recreation room instead of a battlefield, and that's the way they treat it. We're in a battle, aren't we? We're in a foxhole. Battle. Yeah, what would you think, Pete, if you're out in the uh, perimeter and digging in your foxhole and the enemy, you're, you're in a firefight and uh, your buddy over there is playing uh, on his, uh, Wii. his Wii. What would you think of that? What if he's playing on his electronic uh, games and his Xbox and you're in a battle? Would you kick him out of your foxhole? You're either going <laughs> to play games or fight, right? And uh, that's what happened to David is that he got in trouble because he took his mind off the battle. And so it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So David's in trouble, isn't he? The Bible says, Be sure your sins will find you out. Your, your sins will find you out. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing, how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. He's dedicated, isn't he? So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go to, down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Isn't it ironic what Uriah said? As your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Well, whose soul's going to live and whose soul's going to die? Uriah's just signed his own death warrant, hasn't he? What do I mean by that? David has a guilt. Yeah. Yeah, it's either, it's either you've got to go into your wife so that you can get David off the hook. I guess they didn't have blood tests and paternity tests like they got today, right? Well, wouldn't it be 
Is she a bit stoned? If she was found to be pregnant with her husband off the floor, then they stone adulteresses? Well, with, but with the king, at the instigation of the king? Pro, you know, that's a good question. That's I a mean, good question. David would have just, yeah, they would have stoned her because, you know, yeah. Said, oh, I didn't sleep with her. She's making it up. She, she would have been stoned. Well, the woman in adultery, John 8, yeah, they would, we caught this woman in the very act. The law of Moses said, uh, you know, the law said to stone her. Uh, also, Judah and his daughter-in-law, Tamar, now, Judah, she was caught with, uh, found to be with child, and here it was Judah's child, and they said, your daughter-in-law is pregnant. And he said, let her be burned. So, so Judah said, oh yeah, or Tamar said, here is the ring and the staff and the credit card and the driver's license of the guy I'm pregnant with. And Judah said, huh, bring him over here. They're mine. They're mine. Yeah, maybe. That's good. That's a good comment. I mean, not that she wanted her husband killed. Yes. But, you know, if he didn't somehow help her get out of it. Right. Yes, very good, Lisa, good. I have an article, an, an excellent article that I read many years ago. This is by uh, Dr. James Jordan. He's a friend of ours. We had a, uh, a Bible discussion with him uh, a few years ago. And he was writing. He likes to, he's a great Old Testament scholar. He likes to really... Fine, use a fine-tooth comb and go through the scriptures. He likes to put together chronologies. He's very keen on being able to, little things that the scripture inserts as a marker. A lot of times they're, they're putting extra things, and you might say, why did they insert that? Why did they put that reference in? It seems like it's obvious. You know, why would they put those uh, references in? Many times the writer is wants to be able, for you to be able to pinpoint the chronology of his account, and he'll put those markers in as reference points, much like a surveyor will tap a pin in the ground so that you know the boundary lines. And uh, Sometimes we just gloss over them. Like it'll tell you, you know, what time of the year it was, or Paul was in Jerusalem for the Passover, or, you know, it was the Feast of the Tabernacle. They'll, they'll, get, they'll write those things in there just so you have a timeline of the Bible chronology. So uh, Dr. Jordan was writing here, and he here in his article uh, from Biblical Horizons, which I received, uh, number 93, he's speaking about uh, Bathsheba, the real story. And he writes, one of the advantages of paying very close attention to the details in the Bible, especially chronological and genealogical details, is that they can shed light on situations that don't seem to make much sense apart from them. And then he writes, one such situation is that of Bathsheba. And then he writes that something to the effect that Bathsheba has gotten a bad rap. Uh, it appears that Bathsheba willingly cooperated with David in adultery. There's nothing to indicate that she cried out or rejected him in any way, 2 Samuel 11, verse 4. Are we authorized, however, to expect the Bible to record such a protest if she made it? Well, he goes on and studies these uh, chronologies. It, we come to find out that Bathsheba was the granddaughter of one of David's chief counselors, Ahithophel. Her father, Eliam, was one of David's 30 mighty men, 2 Samuel 11, 3. Also, 23, 34. This suggests that Bathsheba was a lot younger than David. And then he goes on and finds more evidence. Uh, so he's trying to arrive with some information that the writers are giving us. And the one is the rape of Tamar, David's daughter. This took place after David's adultery uh, with Bathsheba. And then we have the rebellion of his son Absalom. So he's, and, and Ahithophel actually went over to his wicked son Absalom. Now why would Ahithophel fall out with David? Here Ahithophel is one of David's chief counselors, and yet he's, he throws his lot in support as an, as a, uh, an elder wise man one of these senior advisors, and, run, and goes over to Absalom, the wicked son. Why would he do that? Well, Bathsheba was his granddaughter, and maybe he never was able to forgive David for his sin 
with, uh, with that and the shame that he brought perhaps to Ithophel, Ithophel's uh, family. Ahithophel, excuse me. So we'll go on here. And uh, knowing, here's what Dr. Jordan writes, being able to pinpoint the chronology. He's got David at least 50 years of age. He's got Bathsheba perhaps as a, as a teenage girl. Knowing David, I imagine he got down on the floor and horsed around with the little kids of the court. I'll bet David, uh, you know, David could have easily have... Uh, Let's see here. She might have been a young girl growing up. And then the fact that, uh, that Ahithophel, her grandfather, was in the court, it very well may be that Dr. Jordan writes here that Bathsheba grew up around the palace of David. She would have been two years old, according to his calculations, when David became king. David would have became king. Uh, he believes that this uh, affair with Bathsheba would have taken place in David's 15th or 16th year of his reign. That would make her around 17, 18 years of age. Her father and grandfather were often at the palace. David knew them intimately. Uh, as a little girl, David might have known her, even played with her and all, and all the little kids there at the court. Bathsheba grew up in awe of David, a man after God's own heart, the author of the Psalms, God's anointed leader. All her life she viewed him as one of Israel's preeminent spiritual leaders. She had heard him speak about the Lord many times. She had heard her father and grandfather praise him. So when David called for her, she came. But John, this one in 2 Samuel. Okay. It says, The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. Yeah. So that makes it sound like he didn't know her. He didn't? Didn't. If he had to send somebody yeah. to find out who she was. Yeah, Dr. Jordan says maybe he had bad sight. You know, I, I don't know. Eleven. Eleven four. He had to send somebody to inquire who that beautiful woman was. Well, both could be right. He could have. He would have known about her growing up, but maybe uh, she's older now. Maybe some time has elapsed. I, I don't know. Uh, it's both conceivable. He had to send messengers who this person was. Maybe, maybe he just saw her form. I, I don't know. She was married. She was married. The bottom line. She was married. She was a married woman. Why did David have to ask who she was? 11 verse 3. At the age of 50, his eyesight uh, doubtless uh, had begun to diminish. She was at a distance. He could only see her general form. But note that she lived near enough to the palace to be, to be spied upon, which again shows that she and her husband were closely associated with the court. Moreover, the form of the answer David received, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, indicates that the man assumed David knew her. In other words, oh, you know who that is, David. That's Bathsheba. What did David say to her? We can only imagine. I suppose, he writes, it went something like this. Trust me, it isn't wrong. I'm the king, after all. And Bathsheba trusted him. After all, unlike the ordinary Israelite, David had lots of wives and concubines. He wasn't supposed to, but of course he did. Kings Bathsheba knew were different from ordinary people. Could Bathsheba read? Did she have her own copy of the Torah to read? Doubtless not, but few people bothered to learn to do so in that pre-world. Surely there weren't a lot of copies of the Torah around. What she knew of spiritual matters came from men like David. If David said it was all right for her to sleep with him, she had no real reason to question him, or at least not much of one. Well, what he's trying to say is that she's a young girl. And she's not, she may not be the evil temptress, the evil you know, seductress that we think about when we think of David and Bathsheba. Uh, at any point, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Uh, let, oh, I'm sorry. Let, before we go to Psalm 51, let's go uh, to Nathan the prophet. And God rebukes uh, David's sin. Now, David sent 
messengers had Joab put Uriah at the head of the battle. You know that, right? And you know that they shot their arrows, and guess who was a casualty of war with those uh, Ammonites, the enemies? Was it the Ammonites? Yep. All right. Well, Uriah fell down dead. David put him in the front line, and he fell dead. And uh, after she heard of the death of her husband, she mourned. And in verse 27, 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven, 27, when Bathsheba, when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. One little problem, however. What's the last, what's the last thing that uh, that chapter records, the last sentence there? So everything seems to be on the up and up. Got rid of the husband. Going to take the. David had done what's evil in the, sight of the, Lord. the thing, but the thing that David had done displeased, or the footnote says, was evil the in the eyes of the Lord. Second uh, Samuel eleven twenty seven. The thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord, in the eyes of the Lord. So, 2 Samuel 12, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, uh, gave him a little parable, didn't he? There were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. The rich men had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor men had nothing except one little ewe lamb. What's a ewe, David? A ewe? Female. E-W-E. A ewe lamb. A female lamb. What's up with the female lamb? Why does it have to be a female? You know, uh, all the other sacrifices, you know, it's a male, right? A male child, a male sacrifice. This time it's a female. And, uh, well, what does it say? Uh, which he had bought and nourished. It grew up together with him, with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him, like a pet. This, this lamb, this female lamb was like a pet, kind of like our little dog. It happens to be female. What's the significance of the little lamb, the little female lamb? See, Dr. Jor, it, that female lamb, we're going to find out, is Bathsheba. Representative. Representative. Well, I, I made it stronger. I, I just, uh, I, I didn't use a simile. I, uh, I said uh, a metaphor. She was. She was. Yeah. The little lamb is Bathsheba. Pete said uh, she's representative of Bathsheba. All right. Well, what is the lamb suggestive of? See, if she's a seductress, in Revelation 17, there's a, there's a whore. There's a great whore who is flaunting her immorality, drinking from a golden cup filled with the drunken, fermented excess of her abominations. This isn't a drunken harlot here. This is a little lamb. That's why we think maybe she was young, naive. All right, well, if we disagree, it's okay. <laughs> We're just trying to pin some things down. Uh, Anyway, it says a traveler came to the rich man, and rich men in the Bible don't fare very well in parables, do they? Or uh, stories, or true stories. Rich men, usually they're uh, treating Lazarus bad. They're build it, tearing down barns to build bigger barns. You know, it's, it's not easy for a rich man to get to heaven, is it? But uh, the traveler came to the rich man. I'm in verse 4, 2 Samuel 12, 4 who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Deserves to die in the Hebrew, is a son of death, deserves to die.
and he shall restore fourfold for the land because he did this thing and had no pity. And what did Nathan say to David? You are that man. Have you ever been punched right in that middle of your solar plexus, right where your abdominum comes together? Your abdomen, excuse me, abdominal. Your abdomen comes together. Have you ever been hit right there in your solar plexus? It's one of the most painful blows that a man can get. But I'll tell you, as hard a, a, a shot as that must have been to take, a punch to the midsection for soldiers or warriors or gladiators, I'll tell you, I can't imagine anything harder than receiving a rebuke from the prophet such as David received from Nathan. You are the man. Now, that's God talking, isn't it? Nathan, the prophet, is only telling what God wanted him to say. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you, you see the covenant there? You see the covenant? You know, we're going to have a revival in a little symposium, get together to study a certain subject. We're talking about our liberty that we have in Christ because we know that there's a lot of legalism. But at the same rate, Paul said, even though we have a liberty in Christ, don't let our liberty be a stumbling block to others. What does Paul mean by that? Your liberty that you have. You would never want your liberty, the freedom that you have in Christ, to cause somebody else to stumble. So, to be a stumbling block, to cause somebody to sin. You ever wonder why, you know... Uh, Maybe some people think we're strict. Do people think we're strict? We had a fabulous compliment. He's by a brother. He's not in our midst tonight, but he had a favorable impression of our congregation. He says, you guys are serious about what you believe. Isn't that great? I was so thankful to hear that. We're serious. Because I wonder how many people out there in the land of religion are just going through the motions. They're just play in church. This isn't a playground we're running here. It's a great line from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. What do you think I'm running here? A children's playground? You know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of religious pastors, pastors and ministers who are running a religious playground. It's all a charade. It's all a big facade. And there's no substance behind it. No conversions are being made. No lives are being impacted. Nothing of substance is being preached from the Bible. It's watered down. You just put on a show. It's just all a fake. It's all a phony. Make Christ be what Christ you is. make Christ out. That's right, David. You make Christ out who you want him to be. Instead of making a change to yourself and following him. That's right. You know, can you imagine Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? Why call me Lord, Lord? And don't do the things I command you. That's right. On that day, they'll say, Lord, didn't we do all these many mighty works, cast out demons in your name, prophesy in your name, do all these great works in your name? And he said, I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. You know, we need to know Jesus. But maybe more important than us knowing Jesus, he better know us. Now, David knows God. There's no question. He's a man after God's own heart. You know, he seems to either be on a big mountain or on a, on a, on a valley. And uh, it seems to be no middle ground. I like David because, you know, he's either hot or cold, isn't he? What about the guys in the middle? What about the wishy-washy, lukewarm, riding the fence? He's, God says, you are the man. And God's in a covenant. Look at the I and the you. Man, this is incredible. Listen to God talk. You know, a lot of people make God out to be a big Santa Claus in the sky, make a big wimp out of him, make a sissy out of Jesus. Let me tell you, the Bible says it's a fearful thing. Hebrews says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, Saul, and your master's wives. You know, it, isn't that amazing? God gave him the wives. It wasn't God, in God's plan, polygamy. But they did it, and God went along with it. Isn't that amazing? Can't justify it. Jesus said one man and one woman. In the beginning, Jesus said in Matthew, Matthew 19, don't you know what he did in the beginning? Made a male and female. He minded it, but he let it slide. Really? Acts 17, he overlooked. He tolerated it. Acts 17. In fact, let's answer that because somebody will say, oh, you know, David, I, I heard a, a guy wanted to have an affair in the church. Uh, he wanted it. And the uh, leaders of the church were trying to counsel him and headed off at the pass. And he says, David had many wives. What, can you, what do you think, Pete, when a guy's bringing that up? He's already made his mind up what he's going to do, isn't he? Didn't he? Yeah. He's saying, David, well, help me out, Pete. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to justify. He's already, he's already premeditated. Well, it says in verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. You see that word overlook? In the old King James, it says he winked at it. Can you imagine God winking? 17 what? 30, Acts 17, 30. It's not the best translation. He tolerated it. He overlooked it. He let it slide. He went around it. But now, not now. What is the word? What is the word? What is the word you got? What word's underlined? The whole, this whole sentence. God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent. Can you plead ignorance? Can you imagine telling the judge, I didn't know that cocaine was in the trunk. What in the, how in the world did it get there? It's not going to fly, is it? Can you imagine all the excuses on the judgment day? <laughs> what does Romans 1.20 say? Are there going to be any excuses on the judgment day? He overlooked it, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Paul is very clear in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they were without excuse. So they have an excuse? They are without excuse. They're without excuse. Well, what about, what about the homosexuals who were born that way? They weren't born that way. Oh, okay. Well, if they were born that way, why would God condemn them and give them over to a reprobate mind? And Romans 1 uh, goes on to say, and it says here that they... They worship the creature more than the creator. Verse 25, and God gave them up. And what did they do when he gave them up in Romans 1, 26? Gave them up to their vile passions. They got so vile and wicked, they lost their natural affection. A man for a woman. You know, that's a beautiful thing. Solomon said it's the most beautiful thing in the world for a young boy and girl to uh, fall in love. He didn't say fall in love, but he said the way of a maiden, a man and a maiden, it's a beautiful thing. It's a natural thing. Uh, it's hard for a dad to swallow. It, it really is, but hard for what? it's hard for the old man to, to deal with when they go through that. Why? Well, you'll find out. Anybody want to help me out? Well, you can't. I mean, imagine giving up the innocence of your child. It's going to cost a lot of camels, David. <laughs> well put, John. I'm going to have to pay, pay a lot of camels. I, I said that to one little boy, one, and he, he has a little girlfriend, and uh, they're just sweet, sweetest girl, and, and I like the boy, sweet boy. I know their moms and dads, good people. And, uh, but, you know, in school they have this thing about going with each other, we used to call it going with each other. What else do they call it? Courting. Cor no, it's oh, not. Dating. Courting. Courting is serious business. I always call it courting. Courting. Okay. Courting, dating. It's more romantic. Uh, being an item. I haven't heard that for a while. An item. My quotation marks. Steady. Steady. So I told the boy now, I says, you know her dad's probably going to want you to come up with about 200 cam camels. Well, where am I going to get a camel, Mr. Dowdy? Well, uh, how much does a camel cost? Where am I going to get a camel? 
I said, I don't know. Maybe a camel probably goes for about the same price as a new uh, Chevrolet. A new Chevrolet! <laughs> and uh, at least uh, I really liked the young man because he was really had a lot of sincerity and he was really summoning up all of his thought processes, how he was going to be able to come up how, with, uh, with those Chevrolets and camels to give to the father. And uh, they were on Facebook. I think they're in eighth grade, but they had their one-year anniversary. But good people. I like them. I know it's just... It's not serious. It's just, uh, it's kind of cute. And who knows, you know, maybe someday they all get married. It, it's a beautiful thing. It's a natural affection for boys and girls, for young men and young women. You can't tamper with that arrangement. Don't give me this stuff about genes. And by the way, I got an old art, newspaper article. The NIH had gone through the Human Genome Project. They mapped out all these, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of genes. Uh, there's no gay gene, it reported. It was a headline in the Washington Times. No gay gene. You haven't heard of a gay gene, have you, Pete? Never heard of hygiene. Hygiene. <laughs> it's kind of related. For we Pete's never, sake, let's get back to our lesson. We never went and debated that doctor I told you that uh, said that uh, people are born that way. He can prove it. He can prove it. Mm -hmm. All right. Of course, he has a son, and he's got a gay son. But... Oh, man. So he's probably, uh, he's probably, that having a gay son probably makes him a very neutral, unbiased propo proponent. A proponent of homosexuality. He's unbiased and, uh, yes. Oh, uh, let's not go there. Let's not go there. All right. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. I mean, what's left to give? Gave him the kingdom, gave him the throne, gave him women, power, money. What's left? You know, it's kind of like Steve Martin in The Jerk. I don't, that's, maybe I'm showing my age. That's all he needs. You know, he had the, the wine, the women, the song, all the glory. All he needed was what he walked out of the house with, a chair, this paddle toy, a remote control. That's all he needed. Remember? You don't remember that. What is it? We know Steve Martin. He, he's 64 years old, married to this 40-year-old girl. They just had their first baby. Here Steve Martin's been playing all these family men, uh, 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 cheaper by the dozen, yeah. father of the bride, all of these movies. Yeah. And he, he, he's just become a father. Just like in real life. It, like within the last couple of weeks. It was a secret. The, the tabloids, uh, paparazzi didn't catch up with him. We just found out about it. So he's now entered fatherhood. You've got to go back old Saturday Night Lives and back yeah. in the, when comedy was really ruled. You know, Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray. Come on, you can't get better comedians than that, can you? David had everything he needed. A box of matches, a paddle toy, this chair, and that remote control. That's all we needed. And what did God say? And if that had been too little, it's a joke. You know, he's all this stupid things. He's in an ashtray. That's all he needs. He had all this power and wealth. Sports Illustrated went down to interview Muhammad Ali after the uh, Trevor Burbick fight. I was amazed. Muhammad Ali, he looked so bad in the Larry Holmes fight. I finally got to see the Trevor Burbick fight after all these years. Trevor Burbick was defeated by Mike Tyson. Can you imagine the time Larry Holmes' reign as a, as a heavyweight champion? Muhammad, Larry Holmes beat the living daylights. Muhammad Ali was just sitting there, just on his stool, couldn't come out for the fourth round. And uh, he went back and trained and says, no, I want to give it one last chance. The poor guy, you know, you wonder what fight gave him his Alzheimer's. And uh, fought Trevor Burbick. Trying to fight, trying to make a comeback. Sports Illustrated went to Louisville, Kentucky, went to his barn. All these wealthy objects of art were all packaged up out in a barn. They walked out with Muhammad, and he just barely whispered. He says, I had the world. It was nothing. He said, I had the world. It was nothing. David had the world. And you know what God said? And God said, I gave it all to you. And he says, if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, taken his wife to be your wife, killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, 
the sword shall never depart from your house because you've despised me and have taken the wife of your eye the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the son. Who is his neighbor? His own son, Absalom. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. So David said to Nathan, what did he say in verse 13? It's Bathsheba's fault. If she wouldn't have been up there bathing up on that housetop when I was out and, you know, when I was out there, uh, you know, doing all my foreign policy and uh, with, sitting there with my Secretary of Defense when we were plotting our war against Afghanistan and Iraq, if she wouldn't have been up there, is that what he said? Blame it on Bathsheba? What did he say, Pete? He said, I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said to David, the Lord... Hold on, wait, wait, wait. You didn't make it dramatic enough. You said, I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said, you got to read it like, it's, like you're there, like we're eyewitnesses. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. The Lord also... <laughs> no, Pete, Pete, listen. I... I have sinned. How you read the Bible really comes close to whether you can interpret it. Well, you know why I got Chad to do that. I'm the one that set him up to do that, uh, Pete. You know why? Because Chad loves to prove the divinity of Christ. And those are some of the most complex verses in the Bible. Hebrews 1.8, John 10.30. You've got to really enunciate when you read the, ver the Bible. Romans Make it, 9. Yes, Romans 9. You've got to really uh, put a lot of feeling into it. And we can hear, can you hear the tone of David's voice? Can you hear the, the regret, the, just the, uh, I mean, what, what's inside of him that's just convicted, the conviction of David? I have sinned. Sinned against who? Bathsheba, Uriah, Ahithophel, Eliam, all those Jewish leaders, yes, against his own wife, but now he has wives, his kids, all the people, the church, the Lord, all of those. But who did he sin against foremost, first and foremost? I have sinned against Yahweh. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Now, you know what really hurt? What really hurt is, I think, in verse 14. However, what did David's sin do? The baby died. Well, the baby died, yes. But what did, what did God say? What was the hardest thing that God had to endure because of this? Because by this you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. That probably is what hurt the most. I really believe that. That's what hurt the most. Can you imagine all the enemies of God laughing and hooting and hollering? David, a man after God's own heart, killed Goliath, brought down you know, the lion, the bear, all those things. Yeah, Nathan not at first. Yeah, him. not at first. There's pro it probably took time to get out, but the enemies are going to have a field day because God said it's going to be exposed. I'm going to expose it before the sun. There's no place where the sun doesn't penetrate, <laughs> even down in the coal mine. You know, I'm going to rip this thing out in the open. Everybody's going to know about it. It probably took some time to get out. But can you imagine the enemies? Do you think the enemies knew about the Ten Commandments? you think the Philistines heard about the Law of Moses, the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not commit adultery. I'm sure they heard about it. Can you imagine them laughing at God and poor God up in heaven? You know, how many of us ever, we feel sorry for all the wrong people sometimes. You know, I kind of feel sorry for God. Do you feel sorry for God? Is God a, a God who, can, who, can, who we can have pity on, Pete? 
Are we allowed to do that? Huh? Yeah, but you know, God, we can, we can take God's position, can't we? Whether he, whether he can be pitied or not, God wants us to, to take his part, doesn't he? Now, I wonder, you know, if, some, if we had a case, you know, church discipline. You know, let's say David didn't want to repent, you know. Can you imagine all the sports celebrities that get caught in adultery? I take full responsibility for my actions. I've set up a trust fund on behalf of this child. Well, what is it uh, Kobe Bryant did to his wife after he got he bought that massive ring? Really? $30 million ring. Yeah, something like that. Did she stay faithful to him? After he cheated, he bought her a ring. Yeah, it's massive. Did she, did she, has, like did she buy it? Him and I, but <laughs> so, uh, is she still with him? Well, they were, she was going to divorce him after like six months of him just completely not even going out, not talking to anybody, just staying in the gym. Uh, she finally, we're talking about she, Kobe Bryant. She already put, kind of, uh, put papers on him, everything. She put papers on him, but she gave him a six-month uh, well, no, reprieve. Uh, what would it be? Time out? She gave him a... He was on probation. Six months of probation. No, she was, she was done, but uh, she, he just kept on because he you know, missed his wife. And they've been together since they were 17. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's her decision. You know, uh, 30, God bless her. They're like 34 now. She stood by her. God bless her. And they've decided to remain married. All right. Well, I'm glad. Tiger Woods didn't have I'm glad. Neither did Shriver. Did he give Arnold any? Yeah. Anyway. Paul said you join yourself to, a, you know, another person. You belong to them. Your spouse is free to go. But if they want to stay together, you know, then, then God bless them. However, you, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. In Psalm 51, we get the prayer of repentance that David prayed. And what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we need to be accountable. The worst thing in the world would be to blame our wives. We've got to, and it's not something you can say, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. It's something that... You got to, we got to put into practice, man, husbands, you know, uh, every day. It's so easy to want to, in, in our nature to try to blame other people, to justify, to make, put, pick ourselves up by pulling somebody else down. What does David write? He says, have mercy upon me. You see the psalm to the chief musician, the psalm of David, when? When Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This is the psalm that he wrote. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge whose transgressions. Wish my wife were here to hear that. Oh, it takes two to tango. Well, if you wouldn't... Uh, you know, if you guys would have been happily married, it wouldn't have happened. You know how people try to blame, try to take sides? I'm told that there was a divorce in the church, and uh, they were playing it, trying to take sides and trying to get people in the church to take their side and cause a, cause a schism in the church just over a divorce. I've heard that. You've heard of that? That kind of stuff, right? Yeah. I acknowledge my transgression, Psalm 51, 3, and my sin is always before me. You know, there's one time, I guess, when you're allowed to use I and my a lot, and, and that's when you're confessing, you're confessing your sins. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And then he goes on, he gives, a, he gives a verse here. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, in sin my mother conceived me. Uh, that's, we believe that's hyperbole, which is an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. It's, don't hold his, David wouldn't blame his mother. If that's what he's talking about here, then it, the context doesn't make sense. What David is trying to say is, I've been struggling of all the sins. The lust of the flesh was the one sin that David struggled with ever since his youth.
Behold, your desire, your, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. You will make me to know wisdom. You know, God wants to know what our secrets are, doesn't he? He wants to know what's in the hidden part, the hidden compartments of our heart. How many things in our heart do we hide and God wants to know what's in there, and he wants to know what we hold to be valuable and what we esteem and what affections that we have. And they better belong to him. We better not be holding idols or things other to the Lord in our heart. David said, you know the hidden parts, and you desire truth in the inward parts. Purge me with hyssop. That's the medicine they had, an oil. Purge me with the hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. And washing, you know, what do you think of when you think of washing? Titus 3.5 says there's a washing of regeneration. All you got to do is use a cross-reference, Psalm 51, verse 7, Titus 3.5, Acts 20.16, the answer is in Acts. Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise! Get up and receive Jesus in your heart and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Is that what he said, Acts 22, 16? You think that's what he said, David? Arise and receive Jesus in your heart? No. What do you think he and wash away? What do you think he told her? And what do you think Ananias told Paul? That's right. He left the repent out, actually, because Saul had been repenting for three days. He said, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. Washing. Faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God, but faith cannot provide a washing. Repentance. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish, Jesus said, but repentance, as even though it's a prerequisite to salvation and conversion, cannot provide a washing. Confession. With the heart man believes, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, but confession cannot provide the washing. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken. You know, nobody likes spanking anymore. It's too cruel. Cruel and unusual punishment. The rod. David said, man, you broke my bones. Has anybody ever suffered a broken bone? from being spanked with a little, with a rod. The rod is the tip of a tree, by the way, a little branch at the end. You don't hurt somebody and crush somebody with it. A rod at the end stings. It stings, and that's what in, induces pain. It creates pain, and that indu induces the endorphins, and the endorphins are a natural painkiller. My mother kept a fresh one on the refrigerator all the time. A little tree limb? Yeah. Just a little tip of a tree branch? Well, a switch, that's what it's called. A switch. Your mom did. So, Ruby, are you trying to tell me that when you were growing up in your era, out there in northern Frederick County, Virginia, and it was called Unger Store, not far from Whitaker, but we would know it today as Cross Junction? Your address was Unger, West Virginia, but you actually lived in Virginia. Yes. Now, that, cannot, that is a, a travesty. That was the closest post office. That was the closest post office. Can you believe that? General store. General store. General delivery. You mean I could write a letter to Ruby Williams, Unger, West Virginia, and you would get it? Yeah. Those were the days when our nation was the great. The thing we had there was a tomato factory, a mill, a general store which sold everything. Could you open up a bank account without a social security number? No, they didn't have a bank. Data. You didn't have banks. Did you have uh, money? Did you have like a we currency? Week to week. Barter? Did you barter or did you have currency? Well, we sold from the farm. We sold our eggs. We sold milk. Who was president? Let's see. When I was little, oh, Roosevelt was president. Roosevelt? I remember crying when he died. FDR. He's been 16 years, I believe. And when he died, who, came, who was president? Um, 
Harry Truman was our president. A hamburger and fries cost just 50 cents. <laughs> David said, the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Isn't that wonderful? David, poor David, wants to go back to being a, a Sunday school teacher, a Bible teacher. It's hard to be a teacher when you're in sin, isn't it? It's hard to teach others about the Lord when you are not living the, the things of the Lord yourself, isn't it? David said, I want to make good. I want to restore. I want to pay my vows, and I want to make good and be reconciled to God. And uh, then I'll have my joy back, and I'll have my restoration, my reconciliation, and I even want to go back into the ministry. Amen? Amen. You see the difference between Adam and David? It's night and day, isn't it? That's how we can be a real man. That's how we can be a real man, Pete. Don't blame our wife. Don't blame our wives. All right. Who needs the Lord's Supper tonight? All right, let's pray. I don't have Alex with me. I will. We'll get. Great God and Father in heaven, Lord, as we come around the table, Lord, we acknowledge you and your son, Jesus, who died for our sins. Lord, we know that this table that you've prepared for us, God, it's, we take the Lord's Supper even though there's enemies. And uh, that means we have to take it in the world. We have to take it in the kingdom. And, uh, but not everybody loves our king. And God, I just pray you'll be with Orion as he takes this meal, the, the bread, the loaf, and the cup, and just bless him as he searches out his own heart and judges himself in lieu of the death of Christ and his salvation, his baptism, his Christian walk, walking in the...